Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Dr. Anna Machin to discuss why we love the new science behind our closest relationships, published by our friends at Pegasus Books. Dr. Anna Machin is an evolutionary anthropologist at the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University, England. She is the author of a book on fatherhood, the life of dad, the making of a modern father. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Robin Dunbar, an evolutionary psychologist and former director of the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology in the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University. His acclaimed books include How Many Friends Does One Person Need and Grooming, Gossip, and the Evolution of Language, language described by Malcolm Gladwell as a marvelous work of popular science. Just a quick reminder that throughout this this afternoon's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please remember to order your copy of Why We Love from Books and Books below and support independent bookstores. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. And hello, everybody. Hey. I'm just going to start by reading a little bit from the prologue of the book. Really, it's to explain why I wrote it and maybe a little bit about what it's going to be about. So it's fair to say that this is not the first book written about love. Indeed, the shelves of bookshops and libraries are crammed with authors proffering their views on love from many different perspectives, psychological, philosophical, scientific, cultural. During my years of studying love, I have read many of these books and they have provided helpful insights and sent me down new routes of research. But what many of them have tried to do is provide the answer to the question, what is love? Love is regularly reduced to a set of chemicals in the brain or an entirely cultural construct or the route to great art and creativity. And this is unsurprising. We are a knowledge hungry species who dislikes uncertainty. We are never happier than when we have a clear understanding of where we are going. But the thing about love is this. It's complicated. As an anthropologist, my job is to observe my fellow humans and then explain as fully as I am able the cause of the behaviour or anatomical quirk I see in front of me. And this means I'm a bit like a magpie, borrowing ideas and techniques from other human focused disciplines to make sure I have sought out all the evidence that enables me to present an answer at all levels of explanation. The goal is 360 degree understanding. The result of this is that straightforward answers are often elusive. And the study of love is no different. All the disciplines of academia seem to have their own answer to the conundrum of love. But in contrast to other areas of study where all these explanations can be a bit of a headache, when it comes to love, my reaction is one of awe. I am in awe of the sheer immensity of love, in awe of the way it infiltrates every part of our life and every fibre of our being, in awe of how it sits at the very centre of our existence, such as its power to shape our health, happiness and life course in awe of how many ways we get to experience love and with so many people, animals and beings. I think we are incredibly lucky. So this book intends not to give you a single answer to the question, what is love? Instead of delivering a nice, neat explanation by reducing the cause to a single factor, it intends to do the exact opposite. This book gives you the expansionist answer. I want to present you with 10 responses which separately give a strong and robustly evidence answer to the questions which permeate our discussions about love. My aim is that by bringing these diverse answers together and making it clear that no single one is the complete answer, I might just give you an inkling of the immensity and the true awesomeness of human love. All forms of love well be considered, romantic, platonic, spiritual, futuristic and parasocial, and all the scientific and social scientific explanations interrogated. This does mean that at the end there will be no formula for love, no neat explanation that will guide your life and keep you on track and to timetable. But what I hope there will be is a reborn acknowledgement of the immensity of love and a reconsideration of the many places where love exists in your life. Because I think we might have started taking love for granted, reducing it to a chore that we can efficiently tick off our list for the use of social media. And in our West, our privileging of romantic love above all else has meant that maybe we have forgotten the other forms of love that we have in our lives. Those with family, friends, pets, gods, 
which all go to make us who we are, because that is part of the joy of being human. And like many of our fellow animals, we get to experience love in so many ways. There we go. A bit of the prologue. Very good, Anna. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's start by um, picking up, in a sense, um, one of the themes you actually raised there, and that is the future of love. So given that our future is supposed to be in the metaverse, <laughs> what is love going to be like in the metaverse? I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Because going forward, there's, there's so many things that, that could infiltrate into our love experience. And the metaverse is a really, really big one. So the possibility of having love as an avatar with another avatar, for example. And I think it's certainly a possibility because if we think of one of the things I touch on in the book, and I know that you know a lot about Robin, is religious love. And that is the ability to love without the other person in that relationship manifesting in physical form. So it's very much a love that exists within your head. And I think that ability that we've evolved to be able to do that, I think we can we can sort of exact that, we can take that and use that within the metaverse as well. It's sort of the same way that the parasocial love, which is the love of celebrities or characters in books or whatever it might be, that also is a form of love which exists mostly in the head. So I think I think certainly the metaverse is going to come in. You know, we apparently can do everything in the metaverse now. So why we we won't be able to love? Um, I can't imagine that that's not going to be possible. The other thing that's going to hit up, well, two other things I think, uh, and I touched on in the book, to do with the future of love is first of all the impact of AI, and the idea of 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 humanoid robots, particularly humanoid robots in the care sector, and that's something we've had a big thing here in the UK about about replacing our care gap with these humanoid robots. And there's lots of ethical questions around that, but if we just think of that in principle and ask the question, actually, is it going to be possible to build a relationship, a friendship? with a robot um, because to be able to care for somebody you've got to for example have empathy you've got to understand their needs i think to a certain extent you've got to bring your own life experience to be able to care for them and give them what they need so i think it's a really interesting question it's certainly one which the roboticists are pursuing uh and and those of us who study human behavior are sort of getting our, our two pence worth in there as well and i think the last thing that's going to hit is this idea of love drugs which obviously some of the colleagues at Oxford University have been looking at, um, and the idea of whether, you know, we hate not having control humans. And obviously the, the search for an elixir of love is thousands of years old. But maybe we're at this point now when we understand the neurochemistry of love enough to maybe suggest some things that might just work. And I think that's going to be the next big frontier, particularly commercially. If somebody can come up with something that makes you fall in love or makes you uber confident in the dating market or whatever it might be um certainly from talking to people and, and speaking to people at talks in this country when you ask them would you take a love drug quite a lot of them would so i think that's a really interesting area that, that we're going to see and, and is there an age difference in the people who say they would <laughs> <laughs> okay. i must admit there is my my audiences here in the uk tend to be millennials um lots of millennials um i would say 70 percent female all trying to find out what what science can tell them about finding love um so i think it's a particular audience and maybe it's a particular audience that's less scared than i certainly would be to pop a pill to to fall in love but um certainly when you when i say raise your hands a lot of them it's something they would consider so i think it's i think there are again massive ethical questions around it um but if it was possible i'm sure somebody will commercially exploit it Actually, it does remind me of the fact that, you know, if you look at any ethnographic society even back into history, um, uh, anywhere in the world, the one group of people who have been really, um, I won't say desperate, but very keen on finding love potions or kind of getting special um, uh, medicine uh, to um, facilitate the progress of love is is typically um, the, the the younger women looking for their their lifetime partners. As it were, it's it's probably not so much a sort of male thing. But but you, you raise the um, uh, in this the the whole issue of the neurochemistry of love, which yeah. you mentioned in 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 your prologue. Uh, and it does uh, make me sort of uh, wonder really what's going on inside the brain when you fall in love with somebody. Well, I think it's really interesting because, I mean, as you know, there's sort of that that very early lustful bit, which is unconscious. And then you quickly move into the more of the chemicals which which underpin long term love. But 
from the research that, that we've done together um, and the research from other groups around the world, I mean, I, I believe there are sort of four main chemicals involved in love. Uh, oxytocin, which lots of people have heard of, which is the cuddle hormone, um, dopamine, serotonin, and beta endorphin. And I think oxytocin and dopamine are important at the start of a relationship uh, because oxytocin has this ability to lower our, our inhibitions to starting a relationship. And obviously dopamine is very important in rewarding that behavior. And, and there's been some interesting studies looking at how they work together, particularly, you know, oxytocin is marvelous for making you feel more confident. But the argument is, is that without dopamine, which is your hormone of vigor, your ability to, it, it's wired into your motor circuits, it's the motivating hormone. Without that, you actually wouldn't get off a bar stool because you'd be so chilled. So the idea is oxytocin goes, oh, look at that person over there. And dopamine goes, right, get up then. And, and that's, that's what's happening when you first, you know, lock eyes across a crowded bar. I think the story around serotonin is interesting because I don't think anyone still is quite sure what it does. What's really interesting about serotonin is it drops when everything else goes up at the start of a relationship. And I think the work that's being done in obsessive compulsive disorder and certainly some of the genetic studies seem to suggest that serotonin is involved in that obsessive element of love. So you have to be vaguely obsessed with the person you're in love with to bother to coordinate your life with them. You know, coordinating your life with someone else is actually quite stressful and quite costly sometimes. So we need to have that obsessive element to be bothered, I think, to actually do it. And then at the end, I think those are quite key at the start, but I think oxytocin's role has been rather over-egged. I think partly because it's the easiest one to study. The one that we did, beta endorphin, is really hard to study. So, so oxytocin is very accessible. Um, and it's what was the the first neurochemical we found in those early vol studies. So little tiny furry creatures have oxytocin, but we are a different beast and we have relationships for an incredibly long period of time. And we have them with many, many groups of people who are not to do with our reproductive relationships, which is what happens at little vols or, or our children. You know, we have all these amazing friendships, for example. So we need something that, that can underpin those relationships in the very long term, which oxytocin is just not powerful enough to do, and is able to underpin all those very platonic relationships we have. And, and as you as we know, um, we worked on, on beta endorphin as being that, and that's, that's the model you get from primate behavior, from grooming. So for me, beta endorphin is really the neurochemical of love. I would say oxytocin, dopamine, and oxytocin, they're always there in the background, but I think they are much more important at that lustful, that early attraction stage of love. Uh, I, I think really beta endorphin is the one that underpins that. That And also it's addictive, it's an opiate, so it's amazingly good at doing these long-term relationships. Yes, I, I mean, I guess the, the key to that is that it's very enduring, so that it's what maintains the or, mm. we're talking about endorphins. It's it's endorphins that maintain the relationship over the long term. Once you've yeah. built it up, um, when you say addictive, it's not addictive in the sense that um, some of these dreadful opiates that are being sort of just thrown around uh, these days um, uh, for pain are endorphins are really interesting from this point of view because. We love them because they give us this opiate high, but we don't get addicted to them in the same way as we do to things like morphine and the like. Mm. Um, we can get psychologically addicted in that we keep coming back because it mm. gives you this nice, warm, cozy feeling, but uh, we don't get physiologically addicted, um, which is very good in, in, in that respect. Um, it, actually, it just reminds me in, in some sense, you're talking there about the kind of what happens in the process of um, uh, meeting someone and, and, and sort of falling in love, perhaps instantaneously, it's your mm -hmm. eyes famously lock across the room. Um, but I, I'm just reminded of the um, brain scanning study that Samir Zeki did um, with one of his uh, uh, students, um, where they showed that the, brain, the front of the brain, which is your critical faculties, I suppose you might think of it this way, actually shut down um, uh, so that you are less critical of, uh, uh, of the person concerned. And, and this sort of looks like you're trying to set up a rosy sunglasses image of this wonderful person. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. I always thought that was one of the most clever little experiment ever done. <laughs> I, I just think it's brilliant, you know, the idea that love is blind is true. And I, I think the idea that, you know, because it's that mentalizing particular area of the brain where you can tell someone's intention, isn't it? And you can say, yeah. okay, you're obviously a liar and a cheat. Where, and what I find fascinating is all your friends can see they're a liar and a cheat, 
and that you, you're going out with with a wrong gun, but you can't. And I think that's fascinating. And I, if you think of that from an evolutionary point of view, is that because we need, as well as the oxytocin lowering our inhibitions, do we need that because otherwise we would just discount everybody or we'd be so paranoid about everybody else? It's a really interesting deactivate. Why does it do that? I think that's very, very interesting. And is it just to make sure that we do end up with someone? Yeah, I've always thought of it as, uh, in the end, something to just get you off the fence of the world. Well, exactly. <laughs> But I find really interesting, we were talking about this the other day, is, is that that's sort of been extended to, um, maybe we'll talk about this a bit later, but the idea of charismatic leadership and, and um, yeah. that being a form of love, of being love for a leader. And what I find fascinating is the research that now shows that that bit of the brain deactivates when you're listening to a charismatic leader as well. So that, you know, obviously ch charismatic leaders can be amazing and they can make us do the most amazing things and they can revolutionise the world, but they can also, unfortunately be on the bad side of charismatic leadership. And therefore you will listen to somebody and that bit of your brain shuts down and you will take on board everything they say as the truth. And you will believe it to be the truth. And I think that's really, really interesting that that, that something that began with, yes, rom romantic love has sort of gone into this love for a leader side of, of, of the neuroscience of love. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it just makes me think actually of another uh, direction um, that we might just explore briefly, which you mentioned earlier, and that is religious love, the, the love mm -hmm. of religious figures, be they God uh, or, I don't know, the saints or, or, or uh, indeed living saints as in, as in yeah. charismatic leaders. Um, you know, that, to what extent is that similar to romantic love? I mean, you know, it has, I often get the feeling if you read some of the mystics um, writing about their experiences. So somebody like St. Teresa of Lisieux, mm. the 19th century um, French nun, uh, you get this feeling, if you read her, 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 her story of a soul, um, this feeling of really being almost in romantic love mm. with, with God. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Well, I, for, for the book, I interviewed quite a large group of Catholic nuns. And obviously they are brides of Christ. And it's interesting talking to them because I, I simply talked to them about their, their relationship with God. There was no prompting about romantic love. And a lot of them did come back. You know, they would say, you know, he is my father. He is my brother. He is my lover. He is this all encompassing person who fulfills everything I need in life. And talking to them, you know, the words they use, they were using words, they were using words where they were talking about maintaining the relationship and the reciprocity in the relationship and all those markers that you and I have spent years looking for in human social relationships are there. They are there. They talk about them as this is a fulfilling reciprocal love that they feel. And I think that's now being backed up by, by the neuroscience from, from religious, you know, so there's that brilliant study that's done on Carmelite nuns where they, they attempt to go into a mystic state within the scanner. And I think that is astonishing because the bits of the brain that are firing off are the bits you see when somebody is in love. They're the bits you see when you are interacting with a fellow human. And you contrast with that what happens in a brain when you interact with a robot, for example. We don't see any of that recognition that I'm dealing with a fellow human here. But when you look at the brain of somebody who's communing with God, they're communing with a fellow human. And I think that's astonishing. And I think it shows the, the immensity of the human brain to be able to do that. That's very interesting. Actually. It's fascinating. Um, I'm going to move the, the, the discussion on a little bit or perhaps back to um, perhaps where we should be. And that, <laughs> um, why you, why you, essentially, why you fall in love with particular individuals or, or, mm. or does one? I mean, I've, I've heard observations from people uh, who, who, who've been in arranged marriages who say, no, you know, the love comes afterwards. It doesn't matter. You can do the falling in love bit before or after the marriage. Mm. Either way, it works. You know, yeah. it doesn't work. Some, you know, both both ways it, it can work or not work. Um, but I, I, I'm particularly intrigued by uh, the common um, uh, folk wisdom that opposites attract. And I wonder if that mm. really is true or not. Um, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because what, what goes into attraction is such a massive algorithm within your brain. And I think, you know, obviously, as a group, we did a lot of work on similarity. And there are areas of similarity that are important, and particularly similarity in things like values. Um, but 
I no, I don't necessarily agree. I, I don't think you can have these pat things of opposites attract or, you know, you have to have something in common or you, I think it's much more complicated than that. And it's, it's, it's like love. There are two dimensions. There's that biological dimension of attraction, which is, you know, all the sensors taking in all the information, um, trying to look for those signs of good genes, listening to what somebody says. You know, I do think the brain is the sexiest organ. I think that's the that's when somebody opens their mouth. That is when you can really start to be truly attracted to somebody. But then we've got that really social dimension, which is the rules we make about love. So the idea of, you know, you say to somebody in the West about an arranged marriage and the idea of, well, you wouldn't you wouldn't marry someone you didn't love. And they're horrified. But in many cultures, you do not love before marriage. It comes after. And in fact, to love before marriage is, is a very negative and quite dirty thing. You don't do that. And so we have been trained in this story of romantic love. So the idea that there's the one and you've got a soulmate and I sound really cynical, don't I? But, um, and, and you, uh, you know, you, you're all consumed by love. You know, we have this romantic narrative, which we tell ourselves and we tell in fairy stories and that affects how we think love should be. And the fact, you know, cause again, when I do talks particularly to, to young people, they, they talk about the one or, you know, that there's going to be this one, per and, and I, I, there's not one person out there. There's probably lots of people out there. It's, it's about bringing in all those different factors that come to what's important and what you find attractive. And some of those will be biological and some of them will be social things like, what does my family think? Well, my friends like them, you know, how am I going to have a relationship with somebody who lives 4,000 miles away from me? You know, there's lots of other things that come into attraction than, than either whether opposites attract or, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the, the big issue here is that, uh, you know, if you look back in historically within the Western cultural tradition of Western Europe, you know, arranged marriages were here, there and everywhere, mm. not just the um, uh, the nobility and the kings and queens making Absolutely. the dynastic uh, marriages uh, across the entire country, but also down at the, um, the bottom of society. And I'm just reminded of some lovely little uh, Scottish uh, 19th century um, folk uh, songs where uh, the, the the man is, uh, you know, sort of offering this particular girl, you know, sort of all the things uh, he's got. To, he wants a wife, he's, and he's got a little cottage there and a, a little bit of a uh, of land to, to to grow stuff on. And and he's going through all these kind of things and saying, look, you know, <laughs> yes, can we make an arrangement? This is really absolutely. No, I mean, romantic love is 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 a recent construct. It's very much, you know, and before that, as you say, you know, it was very much a a a conscious objective decision, particularly I think actually for women in history where women in, in this country, you know, they, they couldn't own property, you know, they had to be married to have children. That was how they were going to survive, that someone was going to, to, to bring money to them. And therefore it was a very head decision as to who is the appropriate person for me, because that's how you survived. It, it wasn't all, you know, butterflies and hearts. It's, it, that is a recent, a recent thing. Okay, um, it, I, I suppose one, one area we might just touch on very briefly here as we get towards the end is, do animals fall in love? If this is a kind of natural phenomenon mm. that we have or experience, um, it, is there any evidence that um, other animals fall in love? I think this is a really interesting question. I think for somebody who studies love, it gets to the heart of it because to be able to ask a question like that, you have to understand what, what love is. Because the only way we can deal with that in animals is objectively. Um, and we ironically hold animals to higher standards of proof than us. So if, if I said to you, do you love that person? And you said, yes, I would believe you. But I, I go to an animal and obviously I can't ask. So I want it absolutely to tick all these boxes. And the problem we have is that love isn't entirely objective. There is a subjective element. So it's very hard to tell. But in when I when I think about this, I sort of set little challenges for whatever species I'm looking at. So, you know, um, do we see the neurochemistry, for example? Are we seeing similar neurochemistry? Are we seeing attachment behaviours? Um, are we seeing uh, empathy? And what sort of empathy are we seeing? Are we just seeing sort of emotional empathy? Are we seeing full cognitive empathy? Are we seeing relationships beyond the reproductive? So do these do they build friendships? for example, um, do they experience grief, grief being the loss of love? So I think you sort of set these little challenges for a species, 
But I think it's also to understand what love is. So are we saying that love is only what humans experience? Is it only if you have full blown human type love that you get to say something's got love? Or I mean, yeah, Pang said something wonderful that, that love, human love, love is actually the bun. And human love is just the is like the icing and the cherry on the top. You don't need the icing and the cherry on the top to have love. You can just have the bun. And we've just got this extra bit on top. So it's it's a really philosophical question, partly, isn't it? Is is the where do you where do you place love? And, and what would you say? I think, you know, no, animals don't feel absolute human love, I don't think, but I'm not sure that that is necessary. If you look at animals such as elephants, or you look at the dolphins, or you look at some of the behaviors of non-human primates, there are indications there very, very strongly that what they experience is love. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose one can tick the boxes for those species in particular, and particularly the monkeys and, yeah. and apes on, for example, parental love, maternal love. Yeah. Um, and you can tick it in many ways on what, I guess in humans we might call platonic love, your kind of best friend, as it were, that you feel mm. a, 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 almost a romantic kind of relationship too, but without a kind of sexual content to it necessarily. I think we can probably tick that box on with quite a number of the non-human primates and maybe some of the, the other um, species like animals uh, like um, uh, elephants or uh, you know mm. who are particularly social um, I, I guess romantic love remains a big mystery because it's hard to see but I suspect the place to look for it if you're going to expect it anyways and clearly obviously in those species which are very strongly pair bonded and uh, yeah. very strongly monogamous so species like the gibbons for example yeah with the South American, um, 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 small South American monkeys, the Titis and, uh, and the Sarkis and so on, who have these very strong lifelong pair bonds. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, we're second guessing, I guess, because we can't really see what's going on. Well, exactly. I, the other group I, I would uh, hazard a strong guess at is the dog family, because the dog oh, yes. family, all of them, coyotes, wolves, you name it, you know, our, 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 our best friend at home, uh, as a whole group, they're very strictly monogamous. That, that, that's how they do stuff. And, and I think that's why, for example, you know, your dogs are so socially cuddly towards, towards mm. you as their owner. You know, it's part of that same. Well, it's that, yeah, it's that work. And I talk about it. In the, I mean, dogs are in the book for any dog lovers out there because I have three dogs and I love my dogs um, and they love me, obviously. Um, but I talk about Greg Burns's work at Emory because he, he's managed and, I, you know, bearing in mind how often we've tried to put people in an MRI scanner, he's put dogs in an fMRI scanner and managed to make them lie still which I think is astonishing. And uh, he's done this study looking at sort of the brain activity when they're responding to a treat and when they're responding to interactions with their owners. And it's actually not true that dogs like you for cupboard love. The, the sign is that they the love is there for the owner and not the treat. And I think that's fascinating. And again, it says the do you know, that, that, that dogs have managed to actually have this interspecies love. They showed they showed this pattern of love. And I know he's carrying on with that work. It was a small study, but I think it's really fascinating that 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 we see on the scanner screen that, that they have built this this attachment, this love relationship with their human. That's amazing, actually. Um, it is. Isn't it? Wonderful. And I think that's a very happy note to end on. <laughs> If anybody would like to ask some questions, I'm sure Anna would be very happy to entertain them. We have one question so far, but I will remind everyone now is a very good time to go ahead and post your questions below um, and asking about how long did you work on the book and what kind of research did you do? OK, so the book itself uh, took me about a year to write, but I've been researching love in a, in, in a way. I've been researching love since I did my um, my Ph.D which I started in 2003. Uh, at that point, I was researching the evolution of social and sexual behavior in the middle Pleistocene. So that was a very long time ago. My subjects were very dead. Um, but we were looking at that, that evolution of social behavior from about 1.8 million years ago to half a million years ago. And what's very exciting at half a million years ago is, is we start to see sort of families building and, and evidence for, for communities and all these sorts of things. So it's a really exciting time. So in one sense, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. 
actually looking at people who were alive and really researching love from there was when I started at Oxford with Robin, actually, which was about 12 years ago, something like that. I can't remember how long ago it was. And that's when I came on board with, with the social evolutionary neuroscience group at Oxford. And the job there was really to look at human sociality. And a lot of the work there is on social networks and social media and, and, and things like that. But my work there was very much on close human relationships. So I looked at things, I looked at romantic love, I looked at friendships, and I looked at the very tight bonds, particularly between fathers and children, which is why I've written a book on fathers. Um, so I looked at all those different sorts of things. And then when I came to write, I must have, I, you know, I didn't know much about dog love and I didn't know much about religious love and all those sorts of things before I started writing the book. It's not something I personally researched. Um, but from talking to to my interviewees, the book is the book is a science book. But being an anthropologist, I always think that lived experience is very important. It's that ethnographer in me. So the book is also full of quotes from people who I interviewed, people from all over the world about their loves. And it was actually from talking to people about the love in their lives that you start to see that expansion from things like parental or family or friends or whatever to God and dogs and celebrities and all these all these different sorts of things. So those elements of the book are not my research those elements of the book are from other people other groups and the book also obviously is is a summary of work from around the world in in the full spectrum of love so there's the work that's been done at oxford um but also work from colleagues around the world in there as well i think that that highlights the message really for those of us who write books once you start writing a book what started out as a very simple question you suddenly <laughs> find your <laughs> drawn into looking at all sorts of different things because it, yeah. it just becomes so interesting you know you follow your nose down these 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 lanes through the through the woods as it were, <laughs> discover little glades of the most amazing bits of science absolutely yeah so yes that's that's where the book came from can you expand on love uh, for ai or robots or how does that work yeah so what's really interesting about ai is obviously um we've always had stories i mean all those lovely 1950s telly programs where you had you know your helpful robot in the house who did stuff and that's something we're still aiming for and i think with ai it's progressed as far that people have started to really think okay can we use these robots within what i call our intimate human life so for example coming into our social robot coming into our homes maybe caring for the elderly um there's been some suggestion that they care for small children for example and there is a care gap around the world we have it very strongly here in the britain there are not enough people to care for our population uh, and so this suggestion has been put forward about these care robots but i would say that the research is at a very early stage you talk to the roboticists and they're quite positive <laughs> but then you talk to the behaviorists and they're less positive that we can build the sort of relationship at the moment with the technology we have that you require to have somebody caring for your grandma or whoever it might be because caring is a very complex behavior you need to have empathy you need to understand what somebody's needs are you need to understand how they're feeling what they might need how you can help them um, and also in the very tightest human relationships we have something called biobehavioral synchrony, which is when our mechanisms within our body come into synchrony with each other. So your physiological mechanisms come into synchrony, your brain goes into synchrony, and there's a lot of building evidence about that. And obviously, robots don't have a wet brain. So how do we achieve that very, very tight bond that you would expect between two humans? So the roboticists are working ahead. What's really interesting is all the work on this has actually been done in dogs at the moment, because what they're trying to work out is what is it that dogs do that make us love them? What is it? And so there's a lot of studying going on about what are they bringing? Is there a behavioral thing? Is there a psychological thing? What is it? And that's where they are. So in the book, I talked to a couple of researchers who are doing that work to try and understand why would we bond to a dog and why won't we bond to a robot? And it's oh. that, that's where we are at the moment because when you look at somebody's brain on the scanner and you see them interact with a robot, literally nothing's going on in the social areas at all. They're not building a bond with that, with that with that thing um whereas you know you look at look at the brain of a person interacting with a dog for example and, and they really are so so what is going on that enables us to love that dog unconditional and, and love maybe unconditional mm -hmm. love and and no, so no, I, I think that. we will probably get there in the, in the in the end but not at the moment i say as i i have my dog right in back of me snoring yay <laughs> mine's been banned because he was so he's not <laughs> So I, I'm going to be a bookseller now, 
And mm -hmm. because this question came up, I'm just, I'm going to recommend a book to both of you if you haven't read it. It's by Kazuo Ishiguro, right. Nobel mm -hmm. um, winning yep. Kazuo Ishiguro. It's called Clara yep. and the Sun. Yes. It came yes. out last year. Very good. And I haven't read it. Have you read it? I, I, I've heard it on, uh, it was the um, book of the week on, on uh, the radio, on, on Radio 4. And, oh, was uh, it? Ah. I, and it tackles precisely AI and mm. how they love and the bonds that are formed. And, and I think he yeah. has really, really interesting things to say about yes. that. So yeah. let's see. We have another question here. Um, from Okay. I know your book also touches on polyamory. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Great. Okay, yeah, I wanted to look at polyamory because again, as, a, as an anthropologist, my job is to try and look at all different ways that people find love, and particularly in romantic love. You know, we have this overwhelming uh, narrative of the one, um, but actually it's a spectrum, actually, of, of, of who we fall romantically in love with and how. And polyamory really interests me because I think we're hearing more about polyamory now. I think maybe because people feel slightly more comfortable about talking about it, but it's always been there. Um, and so, and obviously in many cultures, we see, we see relationships between more than what two people. So it's, it's something. And, and so I spoke to a lot of polyamorous. I wanted to, to understand their concepts of love, their concepts of romantic love, their concepts of relationships. And it's really interesting to speak to them and understand how they view themselves and how they're viewed by everybody else. Um, so there's some really interesting research on that looking at the, the negative ideas we have about polyamory that they're immoral they're promiscuous they're dissatisfied you know, they're untrustworthy all these sorts of things and actually when you talk to polyamorists they argue that it's a very moral way of and a very open way of being in a relationship because first of all you're not hiding any extracurricular activity you're being very open and saying actually i do like so i'm not having an affair i love all these people and i love them very deeply and emotionally and secondly it's it, the only way it works is if you are very open and you're very trusting and you stay communicating and so in a way some maybe monogamy has a few things to, to learn this so that was interesting the science on polyamory is quite small at the moment there have been some studies looking at how brain activations in polyamorous people and seeing whether they have different brain activations or whether this, the brain activations are the same regardless of which part they're looking at. There's some argument that maybe they exist at high levels of testosterone, but this is all very unreplicated at the moment. So I think the science on it is, is yeah, not solid ground by any stretch of the imagination. But I think as a way of living and as a way of understanding, I think it's a really, really interesting way of of living your life and experiencing love and I certainly was you know I went into it with my ideas about poly and they were all just thrown out the window it, it, talking to people who actually who actually practice this it's really really fascinating and you know we have this zero-sum idea of love with monogamy that you can't share your love you know your heart is finite and you can't share so if I give you 50% of the pie I give I, the, the other person gives, they don't believe that love is finite and actually somebody wonderful quote was something along the lines of you know the more i love the bigger my heart gets essentially so i just think it's a very interesting at the other end of that spectrum is the a romantics which are also very interesting but um yeah it's it's interesting to to, to explore i have a very close friend who is a polyamorist and we have had major discussions about it because i think uh, the hardest part in dealing with that is jealousy it is and they, and they admit they get jealous but that's that's where the open communication comes in is that you really are very open and say actually i'm not coping with that or i'm not coping you're going on holiday and doing that with with that partner and you're not doing it with me and i think that's what's really interesting they're not they're not denying they get jealous but it's how do you deal with that of course um, well, so have, be, i was just going to say to be fair you know we've we've lived with this uh since time immemorial in the form of polygamous and polyandrous uh, family systems, uh, polyandrous family systems where you have one one wife and, and several husbands. Yeah. There, but they do occur among the Tibetans, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, polygamy has, you know, sort of, it's very common in many parts of many ethnic, uh, ethnographic societies, but of course, you know, it was practiced by the early Mormons until they were persuaded yeah. not to. And some of the uh, uh, sort of, uh, more uh, peripheral sects of the Mormons still practice it. Mm -hmm. um, but the impression I get from 
seeing interviews with uh, both groups, both poly, polyandrists and um, uh, polygamists, is it's very tough for the one person. The wives, Tibetan yeah. wives, find it extremely <laughs> stressful, but yeah. so do Mormon husbands. Yeah. Well, well, the funniest thing about polyamory is when I said, you know, I said, you know, what's it like on a day to day basis? All of them said you need a massive Google calendar. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> Everybody knows where. Everybody else is it. Everybody puts different things in. So it's 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 a job of organization. Thank you for Google. I know. <laughs> that is hilarious. Um, are there any um, when it comes to gender? Are there differences? Uh, is it non-binary? Is uh, this is a really tricky area, so I'm going to tread lightly. Um, in terms of things like the neurochemistry of love, there don't seem to be any gender differences. The individual differences between people tend to be more powerful than anything between male or female. When you look at brain activations, again, if we're looking at things like romantic love, if we look at things like parental love, we do see differences in, in fathers and mothers. If we look at romantic love, we don't see that much difference, but... There are slight differences. Now, the argument is, is that is that genetic? Is that there or is that partly cultural that we are brought up in a world where we say as a as a male, this is how you experience love and how you behave in love. And as a female, this is how you experience love and how you behave in love. So it's a really tricky area to understand. Is that is that just a gendered thing? Or is it something you're born with? And certainly there have been studies looking at how children develop these ideas about love. A romantic love and you start to see this this quite gendered behavior around the age of eight or ten and it's pretty set fair by puberty so you know it, i'm i'm sitting on the fence here very honestly because it's it's very complicated and it's very unclear particularly in romantic love i think i think parental love again is slightly different and when we look at studies from around the world we do see differences in activations between dads and mums and that's mainly because of the different ways they've evolved it's partly because fatherhood evolved much 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 later than motherhood so motherhood has a much more unconscious brain element to it than fatherhood there's there's a lot of cortical activity in fatherhood but that's partly possibly because it's evolutionarily quite young um but yeah, so that wasn't a very clear answer. I'm really sorry. Um, I don't know whether Robin has anything to contribute. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 it, it is kind of unclear. But I, I mean, there are clear, I think the way to look at it always is that um, with all these kind of psychological and biological things is the kind of uh, nature bit of the, the, the genetic components kind of draw the white lines on the football pitch. And the nurture bits uh, allow you to express how you play the game. So, so, so if you like the the white lines on the pitch and the rules of the game dictate what you can do and how much freedom of movement you have. And you can't really go outside those. But what you have to do is is and you spend a lot of your the first two decades of your life learning these kind of things and experiencing different kinds of things is you know the way you play the game then depends on how you apply those background rules to particular situations so you know, there isn't anything in biology that is wholly genetic no. um, uh, uh, and there isn't in, 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 isn't anything that's wholly environmental in its origins it's yeah. always a rather complicated messy mix of the two yeah did you settle on a greatest love in terms of individually or or is though is one love more powerful than others yes no one love is not more powerful than others people have that is one of the questions i asked all my interviewees what is your greatest love oh. and they all answered very differently so for some of them it was romantic love for some of them it was their children for some of them it was their friends obviously for my interestingly i have to just tell you this very quick story one of my the only non anglican nun I interviewed was really interesting because obviously my Catholic nuns had not experienced romantic love or, or, or children love or anything like that. And this Anglican nun got in touch with me and said, I would really love to be interviewed with you, but I'm not sure I'm right because I only became a nun five years ago. Before that, I was married and I had children. And I was like, whoa, you're brilliant because I could talk to her and say, you know, talk to me about all these different, can you compare your love of God with the love you have for your children and when i said to her who is your greatest love she said god 
So we all subjectively have an idea about who our greatest love is. And I don't think it's for science to calibrate that. And I don't think you will ever be able to calibrate that because of that subjective element. It's up to everybody to decide who their greatest love is. And I don't think it's for anybody else to, to dictate that. And that's partly what the book's about. I want us to actually recalibrate, particularly romantic love, and put them all back on the same level because actually they, I think they can all be equally powerful depending on who you are. Okay, well, um, I do know that we love books. <laughs> <laughs> and that we love yours, if it's not too much to say that. Um, and just thank, thank you. you so much for being with us today. Thanks to everyone watching from wherever you're watching in the world. Remember, you can order a copy of Why We Love from Books and Books below. If you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores, we have it there too. And congratulations. Thanks for a really interesting and um, insightful conversation. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're very well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.